This is Renato Domingo Gray. Gray, since you, have, I, I think you all have assumed that, you applauded for him. And what, I, what we wanted to talk to you about is about your process. Because you, you put out about 25 minutes of choreography, and um, you also performed in the club. That's good now. Good now. Got a reverb. <laughs> Luke, I am your father. <laughs> good. Good. <laughs> Okay, so, yeah, you had about 25 minutes of choreography, but the most interesting part for me was you were in the choreography. Mm -hmm. So usually you have to use a third eye for that. How did, you, how did you make that work for yourself? Actually, it's more than a third eye. It's <laughs> a third eye and a fourth eye. So uh, basically my process for being in the work is it changes with each piece. Um, but I can tell you that I have a friend who's been with me since college and he knows everything I'm going for without me even thinking or trying to verbalize it. And that's Damon. He does the lights, he does my music, and he's just been a right-hand man. So oftentimes, whenever I would finish a work, I'd have Damon come in and say, no, don't turn that way because you're looking at the dancers to see if they're not. So he changes my focus on um, many of the steps. Yeah, so, but uh, in terms of the process for creating, I would say the second work, which is called Dash Between, it's uh, actually dedicated to a friend of mine, Tim Merrill, and um, it took several years to actually create that work. Uh, the title came from when I was at Tim's wake, and uh, there was someone speaking from his workplace, and they said, well, you know, I don't know him from when he was born, and I don't know, we don't really know him just by his death. We know him from this space between. And I said, wow, that's totally profound, and this is what I've been looking for, and this is what my ballet is all about. So uh, each work signifies a moment in our lives. You know, in our lives there are different moments and different aspects of growth and change. And uh, since 2009, I was creating this work. And it, this solo was first uh, performed, not in its entirety, but it was an incomplete work. They were all first performed as works in progress as of today. Still, I'm working on things and finding those moments that speak movement-wise. And uh, fighting light signifies the moments that we continue to get in our own light. We um, get in our own way, and that's uh, what some of us spiritual people would call fighting <laughs> light. And uh, then there's till it's done. So there are moments in our lives when we go through relationships and we go back to those same relationships. <laughs> and uh, we end them and we restart them and you never know when it's really over. Sometimes that person might become a best friend or. Sometimes they just might not really be close in our lives, but off to a distance, and that's why Till It's Done just ends on a blatant note because you don't understand or you don't really know what the future holds with the relationship until you really know that it's done. And uh, Till It's Done is followed by Cradle. Cradle we worked on this year. Um, and, uh, it took a lot of breathing together as one, which is very important because that breath really signifies the breath between two people in a relationship. You never know who needs who in a relationship. And oftentimes, those challenging moments really come when you come up with a plan. And you say, well, we're going to do this. We're going to create a family, <laughs> you know, and uh, time only tells 
how that's going to turn out. There are so many complications and relationships and, and love, and that love has to be there. And that's where you find cradle. Because in creating a family, you really have to learn how to cradle one another in that relationship first. I have another question. Yes, sir. Yes, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience. As I was listening to you, there's a passion about how you speak about your choreography. Oh, yeah. But then also, you're I have to go back to that. You're performing it. So that's another element because you, to me, they said you are not only. I know as a choreographer, when I watch my choreography, there's a, there's a, and, and then see how the audience reacts to it, there's a, there's a sense of, of uh, uh, analyzing or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you're in the work, so there's also another sense of internalizing that happens for you. Absolutely. Um, so, I'm, so I'm not going to ask you to talk about it as just the choreographer, I'm going to ask you to talk about it as a, the choreographer who is, the creator who is also process of performing. Yeah, well, in performing a work, we always say a prayer that we uh, give it to the audience. <laughs> because this work doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you. And um, I hope to give words when I create a piece and uh, that I give uh, a story and something that the audience can walk away with. And so in dancing it, I'm not a choreographer anymore. I'm a performer. And um, my goal is to breathe into the work and to express the movement as fully as possible as part of the group. Um, it's not easy. Also, in my choreographic process, I would set movement on the dancers, and uh, I would get them rolling around and jumping around and flying around, doing all the movement phrases, and then I'll say, okay, uh, I think I can do that where pitch my knee ball and snap off and roll across the floor. So I'll do those three steps, and then you guys keep going with the rest, and I think we can get the knee across. So, uh, Choreographically, there's a lot of jumping in and jumping out. Performance-wise, I really just have to, I let go. And uh, that's where Damon comes in, because he's like, yeah, you, you're holding when you look this way, but you, I can see you letting go when you, 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 know, you put your focus here. So um, we performed the first work, uh, Graciousness, which is just about giving thanks. And we actually first, uh, experience showing that incomplete work uh, at my family reunion. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I was full body in terms of performing with getting a re reaction from the audience. Um, you, you could hear a verbal reaction. <laughs> so <laughs> there's different um, moments as a performer that uh, you can walk away feeling complete. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to well, congratulations first of all. Thank you. <laughs> Anytime we create, it's a wonderful thing. Yes, it is. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, but I did want to ask you, you've had so many wonderful dance experiences yourself. Yes. Well, tell us, yeah, sure. Um, well, I've been very lucky in my career to have danced with um, companies like such as Alvin Ely, danced in Harlem, Complexions Contemporary Ballet, Lines. Mm -hmm. I was a soloist with um, Ballet de Lorraine in Nancy, France. And, um, you know, I've, I've had a, 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 the last part of my career, I, I spent most of it with uh, Armitage Gone Dance as the principal male dancer for. Carol Armitage, and so uh, I've I've had a, a, a full career of dancing. So um, now it's time to see uh, you know what it's like on the other side. Yeah, and so uh, the reason I ask is because when you had that many experiences with so many dynamic uh, and important choreographers, uh, 
what do you have to do to find your own individual choreographic voice? Well, I'd like to believe that throughout all of those experiences, I've always been William. And there's something very unique. My friends who know me, they know there's something very unique about myself and the way I approach dance and the way I view the world. And in taking in all the information, it's about how you filter it. And I've always felt like I've always had a, a very good way of filtering the information, you know. And, and also remaining open because it's just, for me, I, I love to consume. My friends will tell you, I, I consume a lot of information, <laughs> you know. But, and, and, and that's one thing, but it doesn't necessarily make a knowledge. But what I do like to do is I like to take different tangents and viewpoints and, and see what it is that will help me create, you know, more of William. <laughs> <laughs> so on, on, on that same note, what we saw today, how would you describe the work that we saw? How would you describe the William that we saw today? Um, well, that was William being, I don't want to say it's very um, esoteric or existential or any of that stuff. I'd like to believe that that was um, something for me. Uh, I. I uh, I see a lot of dance, and I see a lot of what's now, and I see a lot of what's been. What's been. And for me, I, I always hear these debates about pushing the art form forward, or where we came from, and all this stuff. And for me, it's really, um, right now in this world, we're almost at this place where we can, um, uh, I, I, I'd like to say we're almost about to be omnipresent with the, um, the way the internet works, at any point, at any time, in real time. Everything is, you're able to grab everything right then and there, right in front of you. From the past, what's impossible and going to be happening in the future, it's all about to just collide. I guess they call it a singularity, where everything just mashes up eventually and just, you know, it's just all, and that's where we're heading. So for me, it's kind of like, I don't want to say that it's a particular style yet, because I'm not branding myself like that. I'm open. You know, I'll let other people do that. But I'd like to say that it's something that I found through, um, well, actually, it's really interesting. I was trying to find organ music, like contemporary organ music, which is really, really hard. Um, and basically, the only contemporary organ music I could find was like Poland or somebody else. Uh, I think like Killian or one of those choreographers had already used. And I, oh, Hans von Manen, I think he has a piece, uh, Polish pieces, but it turns out it's not actually an organ, it's an old uh, piano that has a particular sound. Um, so I was trying to find a, a piece of music that I was like, okay, no one's choreographing the organ. So I happened to, <laughs> you know, I happened to say, well, let me go back and revisit some of the composers that I've learned about through my years of dancing. And so lo and behold, I revisit John Luther Adams. You know, John Luther Adams is originally from New York, but he's, um, he's been living in Alaska for quite some time, and he's really big into ecology. And you know, and, you know, everyone's connected. Everyone's connected, and we're all connected through the world. And you know, and I was uh, first introduced to him when I did a piece with Carol Armitage called Three Theories." The last movement of the ballet is about um, uh, quantum physics, and it just has this very like. You're on the clouds, and it's you know gorgeous piece of music. And then so I said, okay, let me go back and visit, you know, because there's the other John Adams, which you know, and Peter Martins has done like a thousand ballets too. He's he lives in Berkeley. This guy is John Luther Adams. So <laughs> I was like, let me try and figure out what's going on with his music. So I started listening, and I was just like, what is this? And so sometimes there's certain pieces of music that you listen to. Um, it's it's like a training for a marathon. You don't just get there, you know, in like a two minute sit. You're like, okay, I've heard it. I need to move on to the next thing. I said, okay, this guy clearly is very brilliant. He has wonderful compositions. It's going to take me a while to get through this. So when I started working on this piece, I actually, so what I did was I dropped in in the middle of the music as opposed to going to the beginning. And one of the things that I was discovering as I was working on this piece is that it's, um, 
if I could create a soundtrack to time and what time would sound like, it would sound like this. Um, it's one of the most seamless pieces of music in terms of the variations and transitions and the themes of how they get there. I mean, we're literally in the rehearsal trying to count it, but I'm like, I'm not counting this. We're just going to go on instinct. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I was like, okay, we need to go on and stick with this, you know? And there's a lot of times where you know, you're looking at the counter and I'm like, pull out the stopwatch. Like, how long did that phrase take? And I also believe that, you know, that sometimes one of the things that I've learned as a dancer, that things that physically need to happen within the dancer's body that you need to let happen. So, it just so happens that the way I try to find and the way I work with my movement and how I was coming up with this piece, that a lot of it works with the music. But then at the same time though, I didn't want to, um, as my old comp teacher would say, don't want to Mickey Mouse the music. <laughs> so I made sure that the dancers also are instruments and their bodies also have to resonate and add a sound to it. So for me, this has been, you know, um, this is from the middle of the piece to the end and right now I'm still working on the beginning which I have to uh, hurry up and finish. We have a season, May 25th, 26th. <laughs> Please. I was going to interrupt. Uh, <laughs> There's nothing, no, nothing more on self-promotion. Hey, okay. you know, it's New York City. Everyone has a hustle. Yeah, so, it's, yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, May 25th and 26th. That's the Memorial Day weekend. Yes, it's a Sunday and a Monday. Yes. <laughs> so after we see the next Peaks performance on May 14th, we'll... Trot on over to, where is this going to be? It's going to be at the JCC in Manhattan on 76 in Amsterdam. They have a really wonderful black box theater that a lot of dancers didn't know about. <laughs> so, um, and the great thing about what I decided to do um, is the theater will be bare in the fact that it won't be a Marley floor. Um, actually, it's kind of funny. So this is actually what you'll see. It'll be a... Um, There's some postcards out there. Yeah. yeah so. so just to give you a visual, it's a seamless wood floor into a wood backdrop for the entire evening to give you a different atmosphere. Um, one of the things I, I'm trying to push is more warmth in the theater. Is a lot of darkness right now. <laughs> but I'd like to believe that there's, you know, we have more warmth. Um, so hence the title, Aperture of Time. You know, the aperture is the thing in the camera that helps you focus. And um, for me, it's basically looking at a timeline of relationships, of people that I've known over a long period of time. And I was explaining to them, there's some, you know, they say some people come into your life for a day, a season, a year, or whatever. But then there's some people who, for whatever reason, you never really get rid of them, but they're not really as close as you used to be. So you wonder, how did you get to that place? So for me, it's been trying to explain that without being overly detailed, because there's so many, there's such nuance in our lives, in our daily lives. Like the smallest thing used to make my mother just blow up, while the biggest mistakes she didn't really care about. She would always say, you know, if you're going to do something, do it right. So she was a very detail-oriented woman, but you know, the big stuff would make her freak out. So for me, you know, that's one of the things I thought about, like my relationship with my mother, you know, and how it was very difficult when I was very young, and as she got, as I got older, we became closer. But the amount of time that we had to get close became extremely limited because all of a sudden she had a stroke and she died. And that's kind of like one of the unfortunate things because like that's when we were, you know, we, I, we started, I used to say to her when I was young, I was like, Mom, why can't we be friends? And she would say, because I'm your mother. <laughs> and I, I didn't get it until later what she meant by that. But as I got older, then she became more of a friend. And so then that was one of those like strings of time that it had its point where it ran and then it, it, it got cut off. So for me, it's been trying to explain to them relationships and they, they understand it with their own relationships. Like how one day, you know, you're cool with somebody and then a couple years later, you're just like, hey. <laughs> you know, so that's what, uh, for me, it's been trying to, to do with this piece. Yeah. I'm here with Alex Smith, the executive director. Are you, is that your official title? The executive? executive chairman. That's what I thought, so I wanted. Now, how long have I known you? To... <laughs> so don't answer that. But, uh, 
And, and I want to get your reflection on the performance because, you know, uh, this is the 38th year Thelma Hill has been presenting artists. And for the most part, uh, you have not only brought the organization back from the brink of extinction, but you put it on a financially solvent footing. Okay, that's very kind of you to say. Um, yes, we have been through, the organization has been through a lot of changes, but speaking of peaks in particular, uh, I did initiate this particular programming format in order to give FEPAC a year-round presence beyond the festival, which normally takes place in June and also to give the organization more depth as far as uh, identifying new talent. And tonight we saw that again. Uh, both of these artists who were presented uh, at pretty much at the beginning of their careers choreographically, yes. And we had an audience here, a good audience, to witness uh, and see some of their their talent and some of their new creation coming forward. Mm -hmm. And that's important for an organization, a presenting organization like Thelma Hill Performing Arts Center. And what I always find uh, extremely gratifying is that these performances are offered free to the public. Yes. The artists get a small stipend to not, not cover all their expenses, but at least as a gratis, they get them here. Right? Yes. And, and these, are, these are old world things that used to happen from presenters that aren't happening the same way anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And uh, we want to maintain that uh, because we feel it's important as a presenting organization to, to not only uh, nourish the artists, but to also seek out the audience for those artists also. And in, in offering um, these few performances, uh, free or gratis, as you would say, um, it stimulates something within the community, okay? And it makes it a little bit easier and more accessible for, for everyone across the economic strata. There is one more Peaks performance that's going to take place on May 14th. Yes. And there are going to be two artists also presented at that performance. Yes. And then we and then we're getting ready for the then the season that's going to happen on the twenty second. No, the 20th. Souls of Our Feet People of Color Dance Festival. Right. And that's going to be on the twenty third, twenty fourth, and twenty fifth of June. Yes. Right. And see, you know what I, I really enjoy is that this year the the festival is going to present uh, solos, which I think is a very interesting way to do something. You're going to you're able to present ten artists over really three days. Uh, uh, and they're basically going to be solos by male and female choreographers and dancers. Yes, yes. And this is a new, uh, uh, a new experimental type of format that we came up with. And I uh, don't want to say too much about it because we want a little bit of it to be a surprise. So, but yes, it will be uh, 10 um, dancers slash choreographers the first two nights and then there's going to be a special extra special presentation on the third and final night and so everyone will want to be there if not for the first two nights definitely on that third night it's going to be extra special well again thank you for taking the time out and uh, as always uh, we appreciate the fact that there is a Thelma Hill Performing Arts Center still working and thriving in Brooklyn. Thank you so much, Walter.